Hello, everyone, and welcome to Classical Revolution here on iDagio. My name is Rachel Fenlon, and this is my weekly series in which I get to chat with guests in the classical music world about what thinking outside the box looks like for them, what risk taking is in classical music. Today, I am joined by Jan Schmidtgar. Jan is a celebrated filmmaker, opera director, and producer. He's highly acclaimed for his films such as The Breath of the Gods, Opera Fanatic, and documentaries such as Cella Bidake, uh, Bel Canto, Tenors of the 78, and many, many more. He's a very busy opera director as well and works across Europe in a lot of the opera houses. He is the owner and founder of Pars Media, a production film company. And during the first lockdown, Jan founded a series held in the Schinkel Pavilion, a series of concerts for the Berlin-based classical music community. Uh, they performed over 21 concerts with many amazing musicians who are based in Berlin. And it was a really special thing to come out of the first lockdown. This included musicians such as um, Tabea Zimmermann, Christian Tetzlaff, uh, Francesco Piemontesi. It's a real pleasure to have him on the show today. Please welcome Jan schmidt gar Hello, Jan. Hi, Rachel. Thank you for inviting me. Welcome to the show. Uh, Jan, I, I love to begin, I, I often begin by asking my guests their first introductions to music, but seeing as you're really specialized in, in many different areas of the arts, I thought to ask you a twofold question. So I, I wanted to ask what your first memories are with music and what your first memories are with the cinema and whether there are particular moments in both which stand out to you as really um, sort of important defining moments for you. The second one was cinema, right? Mm -hmm. I think it was Charlie Chaplin. I think it was uh, Charlie Chaplin films that my my parents took me to. But I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure. Yes, I remember seeing Charlie Chaplin films in in real theaters, which is not so usual anymore. Yeah. And and with regard to music, it's um, my my parents were both uh, close to, mu to music, and they they introduced me very early to operas, and and, and I learned piano uh, very early, and so and so on. But I my my actual love to music started uh, when about when I was about seven, at school. Uh, they played Tchaikovsky's first uh, piano concerto, and I was stunned by this music and totally enamored, and and I couldn't remember what it was, and I came home and. And I sang it to my, or whistled it to my to my parents, and and I was lucky that they knew what it was, <laughs> and 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 so I got a record, and and that started my big love for Tchaikovsky, and then for all Russian music, and then for all music, not all music, but oh wow, okay. And um, did you have the ever have the impulse as a after this experience to learn an instrument or study music? I mean, I know you did study music theory and conducting later, but in the early years? Well, I always played piano and from the day on I, I enjoyed it. And uh, at some point I also wanted to study music music and and to maybe study musicology and so on. And, and it it's strange, it, it may sound a, a bit, yeah, masochistic uh, when I tell you why I didn't do it. Um, it's, I, I had the feeling when I was, 17 or 18, that if I would study music, I would become happy too early. And <laughs> I mean, uh, or to, to, put it, uh, to put it in a more positive way, I wanted to broaden my horizon. And that's why I studied philosophy and, and, and then, uh, then I went to directing and so on. Okay, interesting. Um, and at what point? So it was, a, it was a mistake. I, I, it was wrong. But, uh, but yeah. uh, at that age, I really thought it. I, I, you know, I thought it's not a cerebral thing, and uh, I have to train my mind. Yeah, a bit. I mean, not not a bad approach. <laughs> um, I know that you studied conducting with the great Celebidake and also music music theory. Um, at what age did that happen, and what did you kind of gain from this time with him? Um, well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it like that. I I went to his classes. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know whether you know about the system. It was it was very particular. He he conducted wherever he, no he, he uh, taught wherever he was in the world, 
and he had some very close students who traveled with him and who were just always around him. And, and after the rehearsals, for instance, in Munich, where he was chef when I was there, um, he would say when he was, was in a good mood uh, at, at two o'clock when the, when the morning rehearsal was over, he would say, okay, now we, we, I'll teach. And then they were all there and, and, and the class started for one or two hours. And if he was in a bad mood, he didn't. And, and apart from that, he did, he did uh, classes at the university in Mainz and also sometimes some in, in Paris and other venues, but mostly in Mainz two, two times a year. And that was open classes. So everyone could attend. So I never asked him if I was allowed to come, I would just go there. And, and then if he, there were maybe 50 people or 70 people, some of them very shy in the, in the last rows because they just wanted to listen and they didn't want to be part of it. it. And if they wouldn't want to talk to him. And, but I was interested and I, I, so I sat a little bit closer to him. And, and when there was a new face, he would say, who are you? What's your name? Do you smoke? <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, then you answered, and, and then he started asking you questions uh, okay. to all students. But then you were on the list, let's say, and he would say, what, what do you say, Jan? And if I said something stupid, uh, then he would destroy it, which wasn't so nice. <laughs> and, and, and if he agreed, it was good. He rarely agreed because he didn't, yeah, he always criticized already the, the wording the wording, if you ask questions already, the wording was wrong. So it was really a tough, tough, um, tough way of learning. But it was, I, I learned a lot. And, and it was mostly mixed, this is this very special mix of, of philosophy and, and musicology and practical experiences. And, um, and then there were also some conducting classes, but that was a little bit later and, and I really, I did that for a year or so, so it, it, I couldn't, I could never claim I, I studied conducting. Okay. Um, it's so fascinating. What was your path eventually to becoming a director? What was the fundamental um, element about that uh, medium that really, or that, that profession that jumped out to you? I think it all had to do with music. So I was, I always wanted to do something with music. So at some point conducting, but always, um, uh, but also I was also interested in, let's say, uh, working with music uh, in a different way. So opera, I was very much interested in opera and, and giving another dimension to music and provoking music through action. And, and the same with films and I, I mean, I also did other other things, but but most of them have to do with mu mu with music, and I think that's always what guided me and what I had in mind. Hmm. I know, as a filmmaker, you is it fair to say that you specialize in in the documentary genre? I mean, I know that's not um, probably completely uh, the full picture, oh, but yes, yes, that's yeah, what I do, yes. yeah. And I am so curious about this, um, particularly what. Uh, is it for you about um, the documentary genre in, as in the film medium that you feel lends itself so well to you and what you're trying to say or create? That's hard to say. Um, I mean, it always starts with something I want to share. So, mm -hmm. I mean, uh -huh. the first film was, was actually on, on Shelly Bidake because I okay. had learned so much about what, what yeah, to, to, to show and, and, and do it as a as conductor. So I just wanted to, yeah, to share this really with the nuns. And so that's the first step. And then you start and then you, then you film. I mean, you have to convince the person, of course, and then you start filming and you collect the material and then you start editing, which is the most fascinating part of the whole thing. And, and then the real, the real interesting work starts because you, <laughs> You start to construct reality. It it it's it doesn't have much to do with reality. So really, you 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 construct and you you go you you watch scenes hundred times and you go so much into the details and into every if I would can know every hair of you uh, uh, if I would edit this and and so it's you 
really you, you start to construct something totally artificial. And of course, it, you have an idea in mind and you have to, you want to, at the end of this process, you want to come back to reality in a way. And it, because it's supposed to, to transmit what you saw in the beginning, but it's mostly this constructive process that's so fascinating. Wow, it's, it's, um, it sort of reminds me um, of this idea that in a documentary, um, it's not that the truth is a very flexible thing in the end, and that somehow it can sometimes be more fictional than... than yes, it's, it's not about lying or, or, or yeah. distorting anything. It's, no. it's more that you are, you are watching it so carefully and you see so many de details and you, you, you com combine several elements in, a, in different ways and, and that creates another emotion or another narrative. And so um, you, you, the, um, sometimes you, you have to correct what you saw because you think what you saw is not true but what you make out of it is true. It's true. <laughs> wow. Also, uh, with the intention to give justice to the subject, it's it's yes. not. Uh, I'm just not fooling around. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. Um, your film opera fanatics. For for those of you who haven't seen this, you have to see it. It's an absolute masterpiece. Um, and that was my introduction to you, actually, uh, as an artist. Um. And I'm, I'm really curious about this film and what, how this came to be. What gave you the idea for this film? Well, that's, um, yeah, I, I can tell you. So the main character in this film is this very weird um, New York singer and music expert or singing expert mm -hmm. called Stefan Zucker. Mm -hmm. And he was listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's hot tenor. He was always very proud of that. <laughs> and, and he, I had been in touch with him for another project. And he told me that he wanted to travel to Italy and to visit old Italian divas, singers that had their fame in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And he asked me whether I wanted to, to do that with him as a director or whatever. And I said, well, just to, to visit those, to do interviews is not so interesting for me. But if I could make a film out of this whole enterprise and, and uh, be next to you uh, on this trip and talk to you when we, when we go from city to city and what he, he anticipates and what, what he can tell us about these ladies, then it could be interesting. And so it's, it became this two layered film that's the visits with the ladies, but also this trip with, the, with this crazy Stefan Zucker through Italy. <laughs> and 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 then also some uh, archive footage, of course, because they all recorded recorded uh, operas um, for the for the screen, and so I could use some very uh, totally obscure, strange <laughs> black and white uh, films of them. Mm. And um, you're currently working on a sort of part two version of that, which is called Fuoco Sacro, um, featuring three yeah. amazing sopranos. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that project? Yes, yes. Um, it's you know the the the, the singer I love most in in opera fanatic is a singer who's totally forgotten. Kasi, she appears in the end of the film, and she moved me extremely. And I loved her voice. And she she had to stop stop her career early for some uh, some um, uh, health reasons. And and a few years ago. And I actually, I thought I would never hear a voice like that, that would move me like that, like hers again. And then a few years ago, it, I was driving my car and I heard on the radio uh, a review of a CD by a, a Albanian soprano called Emonila Yaho. She had recorded Zaza by Leon Cavallo. And and I heard this voice and, and thought, wow, this is really, that reminded me so, her, so much of Gavazzi, not exactly the same voice of timbre, but the, the approach, the, the extreme, yeah, she, she, she just moved me again so mm -hmm. deeply. And so I, I thought, oh, wow, it's still, this, this singers like that are still around. That's fantastic. So mm -hmm. I started a project. I started with her and then I found those two other ladies who are, totally different, but 
in a way also similar to, to Manila, which is Asmi Gregorian and Barbara Hannigan. And so it's a portrait of these three ladies. And it's coming out in May, is that right? In May it will be completed, yes. And, and I, yeah, we, we planned a theatrical release and I hope it will take place. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm so looking forward to seeing it. Uh, I, I think I wanted to ask you one more thing sort of about this, um, about your work as a filmmaker before we kind of go into opera. Um, and I've read a few interviews of yours where you, you talk very in detail about the process um, of directing an opera from the very beginning stages, how you get to the core of a piece and questioning motivations of characters, discovering the inner logic of a piece. Um, I'm wondering how your process at the beginning is different as a filmmaker. When you're... Um, yeah, it's, it's a different process. I mean, yeah, when I'm, when I'm making a film, I, I always compare it to, to, um, to the process when you, when you go to a doctor, you know, um, when you when you have some some illness, you you start with I hope I find the right terms. Uh, you start with the anamnesis, mm -hmm. where he yeah tries to, to see the symptoms and try to find out what it is, and then uh, and then comes the diagnosis. Diagnosis, then, yeah. Diagnosis, and then come, comes the therapy, and so it's a little bit similar. So I, I start collecting, and and I have ideas, and I'm writing them down, and I'm doing a lot of research and trying to, to 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 bring all together, and to that interests me, and, and to have a very broad picture, and then I'm, I'm looking at all of this and and try to find out what is it actually. So what is the subject of, of what I have in mind. What, what is it? Is it? Is it a portrait of a special person or is it, is, it a, is it a concept that has to do with several people or what is it? Yeah, and so that's the, the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. and, and one which is difficult part in this early stage, uh, then comes the therapy. So that means then I have to, I, I try to find out how can I approach this? So how can I get this subject that I now found out? Uh, uh, how can I, can I transform it into a film? So what to do and what not to do also, very important. Yeah. <laughs> and how do you use the role of music in your films? Um, how do you go about that? I, I always find it fascinating how directors um, place music within the film and use music and, and what what's your attitude do you have a general philosophy towards that or is it always changing well it's um as i mostly do music films it's not <laughs> i don't have to think about it because right. it's, it's the subject itself uh, uh, so let me just talk about those films where i where I use that are not music films yeah because also the film Films that are not, not music films, in, in, also in those, I, I use a lot of music because it's exactly. music. And, yeah. and so uh, maybe an interesting example is the film uh, Breath of the Gods. That's mm -hmm. a film on yoga, so totally yeah. different subject. And um, so it's, it, I did it over many years. I traveled to India 12 times, I think, and, and, and did a film on one special lineage of, of yoga in, in India. So it's it's, it's too long, sorry. And um, <laughs> anyway, I, I filmed a lot in India. Every, I filmed everything in India, and I wanted to be only to, to use this Indian footage. And I then I thought, what do I do with music? And normally, when you see films like that, you will hear Indian music. And I was very uh, reluctant to do that because. Um, First of all, it's a cliche, and I, I I didn't want to do that. And then, in the, I don't know much about Indian music, so I'm a total dilettant. If uh, so, if I would use Indian music, I would just do it as a like tourist. It's right. Like, and I didn't want to do that. And and so I decided to use music, Western music, Western classical mm -hmm. music, which I'm very familiar with, um, and to select music that has some exotism so where the composers themselves play with India in a way or with with the Far East um, and so it's it's in a way it's it's my voice so I, I only almost only use piano music 
and almost only used recordings from the period in which, which is most important in my film. So that's the 1930s. So for instance, I, I uh, used um, a piece, no one knows, you only know it from, from Godofsky's recording. There's a piece called In a Boat okay. by a composer called Zekrer. Okay. I think it's a piece that anyone knows of him. And, and, and I know used this Godofsky recording, which is wonderful. And, um, and it has some, yeah, it has some exotism in it. Or I used a, a piece by um, uh, Sorabchi. You know Sorabchi, this mm -hmm. British Persian composer or Indian. And he, he lived in, in the UK, but he has had those Indian roots or Persian, I'm not sure. And he did himself an interesting uh, cultural uh, um, uh, operation. He wrote a pastiche on Rimsky-Korsakov's song of a Hindu from Satko, this wonderful aria from Satko. <laughs> and so there was a, this British Indian composer from the 1920s who worked on Rimsky-Korsakov's, as a Russian, approach to Indian folk music in the late 19th century. So it's a, quite complicated. And, 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 and that I used in the film because in a way I'm, I'm, I did something similar as a Western mm -hmm. film, does yoga gurus, etc. So it says almost as if the. Um, it sounds super, super complicated. It's just no. also a piece, and it it yeah. made sense in the in the movie. Exactly, and it's as if the the music is also contributing, um, not just a tone, but also a kind of a, no, maybe not a character, but um, it's yeah, very fascinating to hear. My voice. It, it's, yeah. It, it's, yeah. Um, there's a beautiful quote uh, from an interview you gave with uh, IRZ publication in 2017. Um, it's, a, it's a very good uh, feature of you. Um, and I wanted to read it because I had a couple of questions about, about it and I found it very inspiring. So I'm, I hope you don't mind if I read it right now. Okay, so this is regarding theater and sort of why theater. You say, for me, theater, which is experienced at the very moment of its creation and which disappears again within the same moment is much more refined and much closer to the human condition. Ultimately, it's also more stable. What is perfect in the here and now can never be taken away as the moment is perpendicular in the flow of time. Arto views theater as the highest form of art for precisely this reason. Uh, I found this just such a such a gripping quote um, because it also seems to mirror life so much. This idea of what the present moment is. Yeah, I I I agree. <laughs> 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 yes, no, that's why I'm very attracted to theater because uh, you know it's it's a bit contradictory because what I what I mostly do is films and film is all about conserving things and and and. Mm -hmm keeping them away from, from this unique moment that is disappearing. So it's, it's a bit strange when I, when I say I, I actually love this moment, um, but yeah, that's what I love most. Hmm. Yeah. When you're directing an opera, what do you aim to achieve? Is there a particular um, motivation for you as a director when you're taking on a new, uh, a new opera, a new ad adaptation of an opera, of a classic? Um, well, I'm, I'm, at the end, I want to, I want to, let's say, to give the music its right. I, so to, to let the music, um, I try to, to provoke the music in a way that it's, it's coming that it seems to be in, inevitable but that's also again very stuck first of all I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tell a story it's it not necessarily exactly the story the composer offered or the, 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 the guy who wrote the text but I try to, to tell a consist, consistent story which yeah which is already something you have to mention today yeah um, are there ever 
times or how much liberty do you allow yourself with interpretation? Are there ever times that you go against maybe what's written or um, what the story is or? Yes, I, I would, I would at some point. I, I, I'm, I don't think you have to be a total slave to, to the libretto. I think you have to really respect the music and to, to tr try to find out and to, to uh, feel what this music could be meant to be or what it, why he composed it that way. And sometimes it's not exactly in the lib libretto and really sometimes the, the characters, for instance, can in a, in a libretto can be so stupid, but the music talks about deep feelings. So mm. then I have to justify these mm. deep feelings that I hear in the music. And so I have to work on the character to because I want to, yeah, it, it has to make sense. Hmm. For instance, Manon by Basnet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's it's a difficult part. Uh, all singers have to think they have to be coquette, and and because she's so, you know, it's it's the, the story of Manon who falls in, in love with Degrieux, and he falls in love with her, and and it, it's a very deep love. There's yeah. no question about it because um, the music tells it. Basnet's music, and nevertheless she leaves him very soon in, in act two she's away and you that doesn't make sense so because this the feelings are sincere there's no question about that so i have to i had when i did manon i had to find a solution for for that and to to, to find another reason why he left her yeah just as, as it i i love also this um that you say that you have to feel um so it's almost um well, I just think that that's really special because it's uh, it's so much more than what we see or what's on the page or um, and also it's so much about what music is. It's a feeling. It's what it does to you. Yes, I mean, it's. Um, it's it's the easiest is to talk to talk about examples. Um, I, yeah. I was very, very happy to do Delio because I love, love this opera and I always wanted to do it and at some point I could do it. And, and when I started to work on it intensely, I found out what, what great, great um, theater man Beethoven was. And uh, you, you, everywhere you will read that this is a bad piece and that it doesn't, it's not um, consistent. And, and you had no idea of theater and it and so I think it's absolutely not true and you really can prove it in the details for instance there's in the in the, um, the first tr trio and the first act of um, Marcelina Rocco and and Leonore um, there she, Leonore you know she she has to to uh, she she came to this um, prison to, to her husband and she pretends to be a man and Marcelina falls in love with her and Rocco who is her father Marcelina's father uh, wants to wants her to marry his his daughter so everyone wants something different and and um, and Leonora feels very badly because she's she's not honest to these very kind people and that's all about uh, in this trio and in the trio um, she, uh, uh, Marceline and, and Leonore are always singing the same music. It sounds almost the same, but just one little alteration. It, at a special moment, uh, Beethoven introduces a minor chord in Leonore's line. And, and, and it's a major chord in, the, in, in Marceline's line, but apart from this very, very tiny moment, it's always the same. Uh, they are singing the, the, exactly the same music, and that's so subtle, you know, because all this, yeah, the, these bad, these bad feelings of Leonora and the weight of this of this burden, the, the burden that she carries around, coming here to to free her husband and the fear and all of that is in this little minor chord. And and I was really when I found that I was so so uh, impressed by by this subtlety of Beethoven, yeah. And, and yet there are hundreds of examples in the in the opera. It's really a masterpiece. <laughs> I'm so happy to to hear that because um, I I always had a really strong feeling towards Fidelio, but of course it, it's always getting a, a, a sort of <laughs> disregarded as as an important piece. And I completely agree with you in in its strength. Um, and it's so, yeah, it's really fascinating to hear about that these moments jump out to you and 
I think it's also quite unique as a director because especially these days, um, it's uh, not, I mean, not to sound uh, bad, but it's, it's quite rare that opera directors can also really go into the music and find that motivation. But yeah, it's sad. I mean, I, I, there, there are of course some who, who yeah, do that. of course. Dream, you know? But but yes, I, I learn of of opera directors who, who uh, do everything out of the textbook, um, yeah. and don't look at the piano score, which is really strange. <laughs> it's yeah. it, with me, it's really the opposite. You know, I'm I'm so much developing everything out of the music that some sometimes I forget the the, the words and. <laughs> You know, in the, in the last rehearsals, at some point, they start uh, doing these uh, subtitles in the opera houses. Right. And so when I'm sitting there, I, I, all, of, all of a sudden, I read those subtitles. Like, oh, yeah, right. It's, it's, she's saying that. <laughs> <laughs> because I really have forgotten it. Yeah. But it's not so important. I mean, uh, you need to really make this, the music plausible and, mm -hmm. and to develop the... the the motivation of the characters and the whole storyline out of the music, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, something else I wanted to ask you about, because you're going so fluidly between two very huge mediums, which is you know opera and live theater and film, um, I'm interested to hear your perspective on technology and opera and the sort of kind of slower evolution of technology, which is much slower than in the film world. Um, and yeah, I, I think it would just, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about um, where it might go and whether you think uh, we could do more with technology or that it's as is, is okay, or? It depends. I mean, I, I think the, the, the format of the classical theater, um, how do you say that in English? Well, yeah, the, the classical theater world where you have where the, the audience and the stage yes. are and you have Danislavski called it. It's it's some works beautifully. I love it and I really hope to, to work on that many, many more times. But that's not the only way to, to work with opera. For instance, I, I made an experiment uh, two years ago. Um, I did a short version or just actually a long scene from Figaro as a 360 degree mm -hmm. film which you, yes. which you watch in the in those glasses. So that's a totally different approach because uh, in the classical theater you are sitting here and the action is there and um, and in this in this uh, technology you are in the middle of the scene. So you are in Almaviva's house or whatever it is, and, and you have those glasses and you can, wherever you watch, you see this um, set and this action and they're around you and you never know where to look uh, because you, you will, every time you will miss something because you can't look everywhere at the same time. Right. Whereas in the classical theater, you, it's produced in a way that you get everything. Yes. Even though you can't watch there and there at the same time, it's a good director will do it in a way that you always look at the right, in the right yeah. direction. But in these 360 uh, uh, degree glasses, it's really every time different. And every time you see a different production. Uh, and um, I myself, I will never see uh, all possible versions of that film, which is, which is funny. Yeah? That's so, so funny. Yeah, it worked. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in these things, but yeah, also I'm, I also love the old theater. Right. Um, do you think that there's? I mean, I would you explore you. that? <laughs> Sorry. Well, I just said I, I want to show it to you one day. Yes, I hope so. Please. <laughs> uh, our our mutual friends uh, Max and Francesco actually told me about it, and they said you have to see it. So. Mm -hmm. um, I is it something that you would explore more though, and, and also. For example, are there any other technolo technological elements that you do want to explore more as a director of opera? Actually not. When, when I started, yeah. I, I started much later than, than I started with film. Um, mm -hmm. And when I started, uh, the, uh, the uh, head of the company said, oh, you're coming from film, you will certainly use projections. Um, and I said, yeah. no, actually, I don't want to. I'm not so fond of projections. And now they are not so much much in use anyway but um, mm -hmm. 
No, I'm, I'm actually very, um, I like these old theater means, you know, like, like in, a, in, in, in a puppet theater. Um, I, I, like, um, I like what is there. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, light and, and curtains and 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 props and 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 how do you call it? These these the flies, you open the the the, um, the ground, and go up and down. And these things, yeah. old old fashioned uh, um, puppet theater. Yeah, <laughs> and movements. I love movements of the decorations, that rooms change, but all with uh, with simple technic techn technologically simple means. I would say I agree with you, so that's, that's nice to hear. Um, I, I, I would love to, to just speak to you a little bit about, I mean, of course, so we're talking at a very kind of unique time for artists uh, right now, being uh, the second lockdown of a very, very long year. And my question for you would be, do you feel, because of course you are supposed to uh, direct Capriccio this month at Opa Leipzig and so many things are affected by this and do you feel that as artists out of this time we might question ourselves and our roles differently coming out of this crisis? Uh, well we, we, we might question this crazy traveling around and, and I could imagine that 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 we, we go back a little bit to, to times like 100 years ago when, when for instance, um, you knew that when you came to Berlin, you would, you would uh, be able to listen to um, Busoni and to Horowitz and to uh, Wilhelm Kempf. Mm -hmm. And when you went to Paris, you could listen to, to Ravel and to maybe Gershwin at that time. I, I don't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and so every city uh, had a special characteristic of, of the art scene, which is beautiful. And, and when I think that I'm in Tokyo and, and there's a recital of, um, let's say, uh, Maria, Maria Joa Pires, and I, I think, oh, I haven't heard her for so many years and I'm now listening to her in Tokyo. It's a bit strange, yeah? Uh, yeah. On the other hand, of course, artists want to travel around and they want to, to meet different audiences and, and, and the cities want to invite everyone. So it will... I think it will mostly come back to what it was before, but a little bit of that, of that, let's say, a stagione character of or this individual profile of metro, metropolis uh, could be nice. Yeah, um, it could be nice. And uh, for a lot of reasons, it makes me now, of course, think about what you did during the first lockdown and something I really admired about that was that it felt that you used this community that already existed in Berlin, but that yes. had never really become a community. And yes, of course, no, that was fantastic. And that I, I couldn't have done that in Bochum. Yeah. So yeah. Um, in, in Berlin, this is possible. And not in so many cities in the world, you could do that. Yeah. Um, that you have a list which was three times as long as, as the, the artists that, that were there at the end, uh, yeah. with fantastic artists from all over the world who all lived in Berlin. Sure. Lived in Berlin. Yeah. yeah. One had just moved there, I was lucky, Zlata Czocheva. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, no, I, I, I think what you say really jumps out to me because of this idea of community, but I also like your point about identity as well, that kind of character, um, building the character yeah, of the like city. The identity of an orchestra. Yeah. yeah, and maybe also would, would help with the identities of our orchestras. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Jan, it's been just such a pleasure chatting with you today and uh, really lovely to hear so many of your thoughts. Thank you. I would, I would love to just um, ask you my sort of uh, token question, which is um, sort of hence the title of the show, how and when do you feel music can be revolutionary? You know what, what's for me maybe the most extraordinary about music is that in music you can more maybe than in all other art 
forms. In music, you can really achieve kind of perfection. I'm not talking about technical perfection, but aesthetic perfection. So that every detail goes together with every whole uh, emerges that then almost becomes transparent because it's so right. Everything is so right. And, and you can, can get, look through it and, and it's, you're in, a, in another world. And it's that this perfection is possible in, a, in such an imperfect world. Hmm. Tells us a lot about what could be possible and about, a lot about what is not done in, in our world. So I think this art in this way is, um, has all, this is also, I would, I would say, it's, it's a, a political statement, you know? And it's not like um, just being in your artist's bubble, but it has revolutionary potential, perfect art, or art that is really working. And, and music can do that more than all, all other art forms, I think. So I think that the potential of revolution is always there. Yeah, wonderful. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, Jan, thank you so much for joining. And especially, we should all say, on Mozart's birthday, which we were quite excited that it fall on this special day. <laughs> yes, and I, I'm very happy about it because really he is the benchmark. I, I would say, I, when, I, when I know a musician who can conduct or play Mozart, then it's, I'm most impressed. So talking True. about our friend Francesco Piemontesi, he can play Mozart and that this is really the team. And, uh, and who can't play, those who cannot play Mozart, I'm, I'm a doubtful one. <laughs> <laughs> and sing Mozart from a singer. It's, yeah. <laughs> also, also. It's so, a whole other thing. Yeah. Well, Jan, thank you again so much for joining us thank today. You, and thank you everyone for tuning in and I'll see you next week.